And so, Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke 15 tonight. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Now, let me remind you while you are turning to Luke 15 uh, about the pastor's prayer breakfast, and that is going to begin on uh, next Monday morning, but it's going to be Mondays at 7 a.m., uh, and uh, what it is for, uh, it will be to pray for myself and M.A. if he wants to come and if he can come uh, and be here uh, or any other pastors in the community that you may want to bring and have them prayed prayed for and prayed over. So what's going to happen is I'll come over about 6.15 and I'll start breakfast. Uh, and again, let me stress, this is, this, is not about the, this is not about breakfast and it's really not about uh, sitting around drinking coffee and fellowshipping. It's going to be about the praying. But thank God that we're going to be able to eat breakfast uh, and fellowship a little bit. But anyway, I'll come over about 6.15. Breakfast is not going to be anything special. On Monday mornings, uh, sausage biscuit. If you're real lucky, you might get a jelly biscuit uh, or honey and butter biscuit, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then uh, after we eat, about 7.30, we'll move right over into the sanctuary here where we're going to pray. And uh, you'll pray for me. And uh, and whoever the other you know pastors may be here, it's a pastor's prayer breakfast uh, for the men on at seven a.m. on Monday mornings. So sign up on that sheet out there if you're going to be a part of that. It's out there in the foyer, and uh, be be very prayerful. God laid this on our heart. We know God's going to do something great through this, uh, but uh, the Bible commands us that we pray for one another. Uh, and so that's what we must do and be faithful to do that. So Luke 15, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. We've already talked about these other parables. Now, it has been said that Luke 15, it is all one parable. I, I cannot see it that way. I do indeed see uh, three distinct parables. We've talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now we're looking at a lost son. So let's read this passage of Scripture, even though it is very familiar to you. And I preached on it actually recently, preaching about the other son. Uh, that was a place I had never went before, but the Lord had took us there on that Sunday. But let's look and see what he says. Luke 15, verse 11. Uh, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare it? And I perish with hunger. And I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son uh, said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servant, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat uh, and be merry. For this thy son was dead and is alive again. He was lost in his fam, uh, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked uh, what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go uh, in. Therefore came his father out, and he entreated him. And he answering him said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgress I at any uh, time thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Uh, but as soon as this thy servant son, as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured 
thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It is meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost uh, and is found. May God add the blessings to the reading of his word. So we know this story. It's a, it's a story that's been told and preached about probably millions of times in the word of God. But just to recap that, because that was a lot of words, uh, there's a man had two sons. The youngest son decided he wanted his part of the inheritance. And so he went to his, uh, he went to his, uh, his father and he said, I want my part of the inheritance and I want it now. Uh, and uh, so the father give him that part of his inheritance, and we know the story. He goes off. He, he suddenly becomes rich and wealthy, and he begins spending his money on righteous living, uh, and he eventually wastes all that the father had given him. So he joined himself to a citizen of a far country, and that citizen sent him into the fields feeding his hogs, if you will, uh, and... Uh, and things just got worse and worse for this son, and, and finally he was hungry. He was eating the food that was being fed to the hogs, uh, and the Bible says he came to himself one day and said, you know, my even servants at my father's house, they're not hungry. They're being cared for. They're being fed. I think I'm going to go back home. And so we know from the passage of Scripture that he goes back, the father welcomes him, brings him in, uh, and uh, they begin to celebrate. Uh, and uh, the, there's another son, that older son. Uh, he considers himself more respectable, uh, and so he gets mad of the celebration that's taking place. He doesn't like it, uh, and he, uh, uh, he kind of pitches a fit about it. In fact, he wouldn't even go into the celebration. The father had to go outside the celebration to that older son and said, what's going on? And he said, well, look, look what all I've done for you. Look what I've done and look what I've not, not done and look at who I am and, and so forth and you've never celebrated for me. And, and the father said, look, you're always with me, but here's a son that was lost but is now found and we're celebrating for that cause. So that's the, that's the story in a nutshell. So what I wanted to do tonight because I've preached on many aspects of this before in, in times past. Uh, I've preached on several of the characters in this story. Uh, we, of course, so I just want to talk about that tonight in this parable. I want to talk about the individuals that we see here. Uh, so uh, I have preached before on the son that was the prodigal son, the son that got the inheritance and went out and wasted it. So I've preached on that before. That's probably the most common thing preached from this text. Now, tonight, because we're going through the parables, I'm going to speak about these individuals that are mentioned in this parable. Um, but I am starting with this prodigal son, and that's the one that is preached on the most. But I do want to tell you that if you keep this text in context, as you hear it preached wherever you go, Yes, it is okay to preach on the prodigal son because he's part of the story. But he is not the main thrust of this story. The main thrust of this story, if you keep the text in context, is this older son who kind of pitched a fit because that prodigal son come home. But, so, uh, but, uh, but let me do mention this younger son. So the, yes, there's this younger son. He gets that inheritance. He goes out and he wastes the blessings that had been given to him. Now, boy, listen, if I, had to, if I had to take a poll tonight and ask for a show of hands, and I will not do this, uh, but if I had to ask how many of you were saved at a younger age, but somewhere along life's way, you took God's blessings and you began to waste them away in righteous living. You kind of went down your own path for, for a while, and you got, you got back out in the world, or you got back into the things you used to be involved with, uh, until the Lord uh, convicted you and brought you back and you surrendered your life to him again, they would be more than one of us that would raise our hands uh, and say, that's the path I took, unfortunately. Uh, but we see this younger son blessed so greatly, uh, and yet he is so drawn uh, away from the father and from the father's house by this restless spirit that is inside of him. And boy, let me remind you, I've preached on this before, that's the 
And that younger son, he had this restless spirit. And that is a spirit that the devil uses to work in the life, particularly of our young people uh, today. Not necessarily always young. Sometimes it's middle-aged uh, people that a restless spirit will hit. Uh, but the devil always puts inside of youth this restless spirit that where you're at is not good enough, that there's greener grass on the other side, that there's more fun to be had outside the Father's house. So I think I'm going to take a break from following the Father and living under His house, and I'm going to get out, and I'm going to go uh, live life on my own. That's kind of what I did, and that was my attitude, and, and boy, when I did it, I did it right. When I decided I was going to live for the devil, I was going to live for the devil. So I felt like it was a smart thing, and all of my teenage wisdom, I didn't want to stay at mom and daddy's house and live under their rules. Uh, I wanted to be disobedient to them and cause them heartache and cause them trouble, and because I knew more than they did, I decided what was best for me, and I figured in my mind what's best for me is to go join the army and go to Fort Benning, Georgia, to Sand Hill, to infantry training. Man, I tell you, I don't know what I was thinking, but I wasn't. And, and that's, what this, that's what this kid here was. He wasn't thinking. He had it made at the father's house. I mean, the father was good to him, but he had this restless spirit and was being drawn by this restless spirit that caused him to wander off into a far land. Now listen, he may have had it in his mind to make just this little journey down the road, but what happened is, is that little journey wound up being a far journey, and it also wound up, it, it wound up being a lot longer than what he probably had planned on going. And that's what sin does. It carries you away from the Father. And not only does it carry you away from the Father... But it's going to keep you away longer than what you could ever prepare for. It's going to cost you more than you can ever think or imagine in your mind. Uh, and there's going to be a price to pay. And so we see this younger son, he loses it all. He loses it all because he refused to stay under the rule and under the care of the Father. And man, that's such a simple message as I stand up here on this stage. I didn't see it in my youth, but as I stand on this stage, it, it's so simple. And I wish I could see fam. I see families. And, and, and all throughout my ministry, I can go to churches today, and I can show you places where people used to sit, and they don't sit anymore. And the same way with here. And I'm going to tell you what happened uh, in, in the church. In, in the church when COVID hit, uh, the church in general, uh, lost about a fifth to a quarter of its members. And many of those people, they never came back to the church. And from time to time, these people I think of that used to be here very faithfully. Uh, and then when COVID hit, uh, they left and they never come back. And it's not that they went somewhere else to church. It's they never come back to church, period. They just walked away from the Lord altogether. And boy, listen... One day they'll find themselves just like this younger son. They'll begin to be in want. I want to move fast. And so, but then there's this citizen of the far country that this younger son joined himself to. Uh, and so he let himself come under that individual's care. Now that citizen of a far country, that's representative of Satan in this parable or the devil himself. And so notice when this son joined himself to that citizen of that far country, notice he didn't give him some noble job doing something uh, that would uh, fill his pockets with wealth uh, and prosperity and blessings. But he sent him into the field to feed his hogs. He went from living in the father's house to slopping hogs just to survive. Uh, and so uh, that's that, that, and that's what the devil does. See, what he always does is he promises us better, but he never delivers on that promise. He promises greener grass on the other side. He promises more freedom if we would stop living under the authority of God's Word or under the, under the, uh, the authority of the Bible. Uh, he promises us freedom and deliverance uh, if, we, if we'll take our lives and we'll just start living the way we want to. But that's never how it works out. What always happens is, is we become a slave to sin. And we miss the blessings and the goodness of God. We trade that for slopping hogs for the devil himself. 
And so in this parable, we see there's that son, yes, he leaves the father's house, but he's being drawn by this restless spirit to leave, and, and it's the enemy that's created that restless spirit in him, uh, and he joins himself to that citizen of that far country uh, who is a picture of Satan uh, in this text. And so then as we, we read through the story, then there, of course, is the father. Uh, and so I've always said, of course, like I said, keeping the text in context, you'll have to go back and listen to that message about the older son several months ago, I guess three or four months ago. Uh, but in this parable, if we're going to talk about the younger son who become the prodigal son, uh, then we absolutely have to talk about the father in this picture. And, and so what I want you to see is, is, yes, we can preach about that prodigal son, and yes, we can uh, magnify that prodigal's waste, and we can magnify his want and his need that develops because he's wasted away all the goodness and the blessing of God. Uh, and so we could really magnify that younger son and all of his sins and all of his stupidity and all of that. And so we could stand up here and we could say this is a story of a prodigal son. This young man, he was foolish. This young man, he was stupid. This young man, he was careless. This young man uh, was an idiot. This young man uh, was so wasteful. We could stand up here and say all of these things about that prodigal son. But I'm going to tell you what we've got to do is we've got to turn and look at the father in this parable because what we really see is, is there's an emphasis not on that younger prodigal son, but there's an emphasis here on a loving father who is forgiving and willing to let that prodigal son come home and come back to the father's house. Now, I say all that to say this. I have heard, the, I've heard this parable preached, and I've heard uh, this uh, prodigal son preached in such a way uh, and so much depravity uh, placed upon that prodigal son. It was almost preached in a way to where that prodigal couldn't come back if he wanted to come back because he had went so far. And I want you to know that's not true because the entire Bible, or much of the Old Testament, I should say, is written to backslidden Israel where God is begging backsliders uh, to come home and to return unto him. And that's what he said. He said, if you return unto me, I will return unto you. But the spotlight, uh, as we're thinking about this prodigal and the father, is going to be on the father. Because here's this father. He's got a son that has left the father's house. He's looking for that father, that son. He's waiting for that son. He's watching for that son. He, in fact, not only that, but he knows that one day that son is going to respond to drawing grace. And that son is going to come back home. And there's going to be a celebration to be had. So I say that to say this for those watching on Liberty Life, and for those of you who are here. If you have been praying for a prodigal, let me tell you this. If you've been praying for somebody who's left the Lord and has not come back, let me encourage you with this passage that we're reading tonight. And you need to know that there's a Father in heaven that's looking, watching, waiting, welcoming that, that wayward sinner to come back to the Father's house. And just as God did it in Luke 15, God can do it again in your life and in that prayer need that you're praying for tonight. So there's this, there's this father, and it's really interesting if you study the wording, because uh, the Bible says uh, that, that this father, that he saw that son while he was a long way off. Now, if you study the original text in, in the Greek, and you, you really get a, an idea of what was taking place, and what was taking place here was this. It's not like that father was outside busting wood one day, and he looks up, and over across the hill... He sees somebody and it's his boy and he recognizes him. And he throws down, he throws down that, uh, uh, that, that whatever he's cutting the wood with. He throws down that axe or he throws down that go devil and he takes off and he runs to the sun. He embraces him. He brings him home to have a celebration. No, no, it's much deeper than that. In fact, from the literal language of the text, what this father was doing was every day. He was going out to the farthest place where he could go from his house, where he, a vantage point where he, he could see further than on any place else on his property. And he would go every day and he would look. And he would go every day and he would look. And he would go every day and he would look because he was hoping that there would be this prodigal son who would eventually come home. And he was watching and he was waiting. 
uh, and he was preparing for that day. And he was, he was sure that his love was enough, that his love had been good enough, even though the son uh, worshipped the, the inheritance. The father knew that one day that love would prevail and that prodigal would come home. And so every day he's going and he's looking and he's going and he's looking and he's going and he's looking. Man, if you're praying for somebody to come back in, don't quit praying, but keep praying. And not only keep praying, but go looking every day. Go looking every day. Go looking every day. i never forget me and a friend of mine were praying for this man he knew. He's a pastor. My friend's a pastor. And he said uh, the man had been saved, but he, he had got out of the Lord's will and he had actually become a man of reputation in the community and not good reputation. He'd become a man of very bad reputation and very bad rapport. In fact, he was known as the most evil, wicked man in that community. And me and my friend and I, we started praying for that man and calling his name out. And I told my friend, because I was so confident in what God's Spirit was doing in our hearts as we prayed together about this, I said, you keep me informed. And every time I talked to him, I said, tell me about uh, that man. Tell me about that man. Tell me about that man. And one day my friend calls me. He said, hey, listen. He said, I've got to tell you something about somebody. And I called that man by name. And I said, Was it, is it about him? And he said, how did you know? And I said, because I knew because I'd been looking and I'd been watching and I'd been waiting in prayer that God was going to hear these prayers. And that man showed up to church one Sunday and he walked down that aisle and he got in that altar and he got his heart right with the Lord Jesus Christ and he became a help to the Lord in everything that preacher did in that church. And so listen, that father, he went looking every day, every day, every day, every day. He's watching and waiting for that prodigal to come home. And that's why we, while we pray, while we sing, while we preach, we've got to remember there's people that used to walk with the Lord that are no longer walking with the Lord. I think some of them have never been genuinely saved or born again, but I do think some of them have been saved. They've just drifted afar from the Lord. And they never intended on going that far, staying that long. But that's where the devil carried them to. And so there's this father. And by the way, I've talked about the ring before that was on his hand, that the, that the father put on his hand, the sandals on his feet, the robe on his back. Those all, we could, preach, we could preach a sermon on every one of those things that the father did for that son when he returned home. But for me, the most significant thing is, is when the father says, go kill the fatted calf. Because here's the thing, you don't fatten a calf up in an hour and kill it to be eaten at a celebration that night. But for months, that father had been fattening that calf because he knew that one day, sometime, that that son was going to come across that hill and there'd be a celebration to be had and he had to have everything ready for when that son come home. And so, boy, listen, I don't know about you, I've been praying for salvation of souls, particularly this week, salvation of souls inside this church, uh, but uh, we need to be praying for prodigals to come home because that's in the Word of God, and that's in the Bible. And listen, if home is Liberty Baptist Church and someone shows up here Sunday that we've not seen in, in years and they fall under great conviction and they get up and walk the aisle and come get in this altar and get their heart right with the Lord, then I praise the Lord for it. But if it's just a phone call that lets us know, hey, you remember such and such that used to come to church at Liberty? Well, they went to a church down the road or in the next county over or whatever the case may be, and they got their hearts right today and they're, they're sold out and surrendered to Jesus, then we'll rejoice just the same. Uh, and so, and then, so there's the father. We, speaking of the father, the prodigal son, the citizen of the far country who is representative of Satan in that text. And then there's that, that older son. I close with this. I'm not going to preach that sermon again because I just preached it a couple of months ago. Uh, and, you know, you can go back and, and watch it. But then there's that older son. And, and I look at that older son and I just want to say, what a, what a stinking brat. What a stinking brat. I mean, that's about the worst I could say in church, so that's all I'm going to stop right there. But really, his brother comes home after he watched his mama and his daddy worry themselves to death, wondering if that son was even alive anymore. And he, and he, and he sees this brother come home, and, and the older son 
is, he, he's all about himself. And, and he said, and if you look, read through the text, you'll see that. He says, but look what all I've done. I've done this, and I've done that, and I've not been that, and I've not been that. But what about me? You've never had a celebration for me. And the father says, yeah, but everything I have is yours. You live in my house under my care. And everything I have is, is as good as yours. And, and, and you're always with me. Your brother here, he's been lost, but now he's found. He's come home, so we're, we're celebrating. But boy, that older son, he was a stinker in this story because it's all about him. And the thing I brought out in this text, because this, this is the way that passage culminates and it ends, and so this is the thrust of this text. It's about this older son. And, and so we very much see that in our churches today, and here's how so. Because we've been in this church a long time, and this is my church, and look what all I've done in this church. And I used to teach Sunday school, and I used to uh, be part of WMU, and I used to do Bible school, and I used to, uh, you know, uh, do this in the church or do that in the church, and it's all about me. Well, who are these new people? Who are these folks that are coming in? I've never seen them before. I've never heard of them before. What about us, and what about me, and what about I? That's the, the country club mentality in our churches. And, in, and that's what this brother represents. And, and, he, and he, he's not worried at all about the needs of others. And so many of our churches today, they simply exist to be a country club. They, they exist to cater to the needs of the people in the church. And, and, and sadly, our churches, our church leadership and pastors have followed suit. That's what we have now tried to do with church. Instead of being fishers of men, uh, new church leaders are now focused on being keepers of the aquarium, which means this. It means I have got to tickle you every day of the week to keep you happy and to keep you here. I've got to meet your needs on Sunday nights. I've got to meet your needs on Monday nights. I've got to do something for your kids on Tuesday. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. On Friday nights, I need to have something for you and your wife. On Saturday nights, I need to have singles ministries for your single kids. And, and on Sunday morning, we've got to have three or four different things going on because I have got to meet all of these needs that you have. I've got to try to keep you happy. I've got to try to keep you pumped up and primed up and excited about something because the Holy Spirit's not around the church. And so I have to try to fill our days with activity and fill your life with busyness to keep you happy so you don't go down the road to the church who can offer you more. That's the mentality in our churches today. But I want you to know country club mentality is not, it does not exist in the Word of God. It does not. What exists in the early church is this, a church that is outwardly minded. You hear me say this all the time. I'll say it till I die. But what ex the early church was a church... It was all about preaching Jesus to their Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. They were all about reaching out to help the, the, the hopeless and the helpless and those in need. Their focus was outward. Okay, yes, we need to have great fellowship in our church. But I want to tell you what ought to strengthen our fellowship more than anything and what ought to build fellowship is you and I getting together and knowing we've been saved by grace and we're not on our way to hell. And I get to be around you and know that you're saved and that you're not on your way to hell and you get to be around me and we get to talk about the Lord. Uh, and listen, I got a nephew who God's done miracles in his life. And he, he may come here and speak one day in a few months, but God's done miracles in his life. Uh, and, he, and he got word back to me uh, that he, when he can come and see me and visit me, uh, that he just wants to know if it's okay if we just sit around and talk about Jesus for a little while. It's the teenage boy. Man, listen, that ought to build our fellowship. Yes, there's things we're going to do to encourage fellowship and to, and to have a good time. We're going to laugh and all of that, but I want you to understand this. We are not a country club. We're not a country club, and we'll never be a country club. If you're watching tonight, and you're wanting to come, and you're wanting to see all of our programs and all of the benefits that you get by being a part of this church, listen, the only benefit I can tell you is I want to know where you're going to work at. What are you going to do in this church? How are you going to help us in outreach? 
sign up somewhere because there's plenty to do for the kingdom of God. We, uh, I can tell this now, but uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago or so, we did an outreach and uh, we actually reached this particular family and I happened to be at that outreach event and, and was the one that made a connection with this family. And well, they come visited us for a couple of times uh, and then... Um, then I really didn't see them no more. I thought there was a really good connection there, so forth and whatever. Uh, so, but a couple of weeks later, maybe a month or two later, I run into them again somewhere, and I was like, "Hey, man, how you doing? You know, you know, uh, how's your family and all that stuff?" And uh, the the he felt the the dad felt he felt uh, just I don't know some kind of need to let me know why they weren't coming here anymore. And so here's what he said. He said, "Well, he said we're still in church, but he said we're going." to this other church now, and he named the church. He said, they just got a lot more activities, they got a lot more things they do, and they got a lot more things for our kids. And so I started thinking in my mind, all that stuff may be good, I don't know, it may be good, but he didn't say the most important things. Like, I, I want to know, do they even believe the Word of God? Do they stand on the Word of God? Do they preach the Word of God? Is the Spirit of God even in that church, or is it just full of activities? Like, if I had to pick up my family and move somewhere, that's, two, that's the first two on my list. What you're doing as far as activities go is not of any concern of mine. I want to know, are you preaching the Word of God, uh, and are you rightly dividing the Word of God, and is the Spirit of God around and even present in that church? And if those two criteria are met, then we may visit there a while and determine if that's where God wants us to make our home at. But that's the most important two things that you'll find in a church. Are they preaching the Word? Is the Word being taught? Uh, and is the Spirit of God even present and even around? Uh, so anyway, so there's that attitude and that mentality. And I've had people call me say, "What does your church? What can your church offer me?" I've had that phone call before, and, and I say, "What can you offer us besides an annoying phone call at eight o'clock in the morning? What can you offer us? Where can you serve at?" Because we've got, listen, the fields are white with harvest and the labors are few. So we're praying for God to send us labors. And that's what I'm praying for tonight, that God will send us labors. To but here's this older son, and I'm going to close now. Here's this older son, and he's mad because he didn't get his way and he didn't get his needs met. And man, this is the older son. He's not supposed to still be walking around sucking on a pacifier and dragging a blankie with a little poofy diaper on his backside. He's supposed to be grown, living and acting like a man in that house, in his father's house. But he's acting like a child in the father's house. And so that's the characters. There's the father, there's a son, a prodigal son, there's an older son, there's a citizen of that far land. So as you read this text, because your, your heading will say in your, most of your Bibles, the prodigal son. Don't get so focused on the prodigal that you miss the other characters in this text. And of course, don't miss that loving father who's gracious to both sons.